days before there was noise, wherever we went, crowds cheering, sometimes yelling. But now in front of his tomb, just silence. I had gathered all my spices and oils intending to anoint the body. But when I got there, He was gone. Jesus changed my life. Ever since the day that I met him in Galilee, he rescued me. And I followed him ever since. All the way to his death. But there was the tomb. And it was empty. My heart broke into a thousand pieces. I turned and there was a gardener, and I asked him if he knew where they had taken Jesus' body. But I recognized it was Jesus. It was my Lord. He taught us that his sheep would recognize his voice, and I knew him. I knew him the minute he said my name. I dropped to my knees. What else could I do but cling to him? I never wanted to let him out of my sight. But no. He had different plans for me. He wanted me to let the others know about the good news. I ran as fast as my legs would carry me, shouting like an excited child. Mary Magdalene is absolutely sure that Jesus is the risen, one true God. She was changed by him from a woman that was tormented with demon possession to one of his most devoted followers. She walked with him, listened to him, learned from him. She waited on him, hand and foot, and did all that she was asked to do. And she watched him die on the cross. She was there. And now she stays with fervent assertion that he has beaten death. He has risen from the tomb and that he is alive. To her, Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior of the world. What is Jesus to you? We come this morning to celebrate the most holy day of the Christian calendar. This day we call Easter is certainly not about presents, chocolate, or eggs. It's not about dressing up and putting on a hat and looking good. It's not about anything other than worshiping the risen Savior. Everybody say, risen Savior. Risen Savior. Jesus is alive and well. Jesus was dead, 
and now is alive. Jesus beat death and looked down his nose at Satan and is now sitting at the right hand of God the Father. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. The grave is empty. He is risen. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Jesus is alive. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we can say that with assurance. You are alive. And you love us. You once were dead, but now you're not. Thank you for dying for us. For beating death. For loving us and for being our intercessor. Now open our hearts, open our ears. Let us both feel and hear you today. In the name of Jesus, we pray, and all God's children said, Amen. The death of Jesus, and folks, make sure of one thing the crucifixion killed Jesus Christ. He was dead. That was part of the plan of salvation, which God put into play the instant Jesus came to earth as that little baby boy. Okay? That great plan included life and death and resurrection. It included you and me here this morning. And it included the women who knew and loved Jesus that went to the tomb early that Sunday morning. So let's read a little bit of John's account of Easter Sunday morning. If you've got your Bibles, we're going to be in John chapter 20. If you don't, it'll be on the screen. So let's go to the screen and let's rock it. Okay? John chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. And may God add his blessing to the reading of the word throughout our time together today. This is the first visit. The very first visit. And the first visit included the women coming to anoint the body. You see, because of the short interim between Jesus' death on Friday and the coming of the Sabbath on Friday evening, the women who stood by that cross and watched Him for all those hours and saw Him die and watched Him take Him off the cross Those women could not do what was the natural Jewish thing. And that was to prepare the body for burial. To anoint the body. They had to go home and rest. While another man took Jesus and put him in his own tomb. But the women, they didn't get to complete their task on that Friday. And it bothered them. And they had to deal with that. You see, they had to wait. See, after sundown on Saturday, the end of the Sabbath, is when they could start doing something again. Do you realize that on the Sabbath, you could not cook? You could not clean? Nobody could work? Nobody did anything? The Sabbath was holy. And so this is the same way. The Sabbath is holy. Jesus is dead. And the Sabbath comes, and the women who so desperately love Jesus from the depths of their soul wanted to be there they could do nothing so they at the end of the Sabbath they probably purchased or prepared the spices and then early Sunday morning they went to anoint the body of Jesus now as you read your scripture you uh, and I encourage you to read the story from all four gospels you're going to see that they all come together some add stuff, some take away but the one thing that we do know is that there was certainly more than just one woman that came. It was a gaggle of women. It was a group of women. Look, women can't go to the bathroom alone. Okay? Right? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. You're eating dinner with them. Five women get up at the same time. But only because one woman said, I have to go pat my nose. All of them are like this. Yeah, I do too. I do too. I do too. And off they go. They go together. Ah. These women love Jesus so much, this is something that they wanted to do for Him. Scripture tells us Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, Salome, and perhaps other women. But John, the Gospel writer of John, John himself, focuses on Mary Magdalene. So we see Mary Magdalene heading the group. And she is, 
in the front. And when they get there, the stone has been moved away. Now, let me just give you this. No matter what your idea is of the sepulcher or Jesus' tomb, let's revisit that. Let's make sure that we're all on one accord. When you go into uh, ancient writings, when you think about the Jewish custom, this isn't something that had a door you walked in and you just walked in and here it is. These things almost always were hewn to cut out of rock, out of stone. And with it, it was not a large thing. Even some of the pictures that you will see of Jesus' tomb is like, you know, uh, the grand suite at the Marriott. Okay? It's not like that. First off, in order to get in it, you would have to bend down and go into a small opening. Bend down, and you would go down into the opening. And it would be small. And a lot of times, they would cut beds, if you will, or ledges, if you will, out of the side of the rock. And that's where they laid the bodies. It's a small place. But the one thing that they did extremely well was how they positioned the stone. The stone wasn't just some little old thing, this thin and that big. It's a big honking thing. Everybody say honking. Honking. All right. Y'all sounded silly, but that was pretty good. It's, it is a big piece of rock. And the thing I want to lay at your feet today is that it was in a track cut out of, other, of the rest of the world. And with it, it rolls down. Well, Pastor Mark, so what? Well, it comes to play, doesn't it? As much muscle as old Pastor Mark has, I don't think that I could myself take that big, huge stone and roll it back up because it is at a slant. It comes to play comes to play. So we see that when Mary gets there and she comes up into that garden area, that cemetery as we call it, but a garden area, we see that the stone has been moved away. Huh? You know why they use that stone like that? Man, there were people called grave robbers. And they literally would go in and steal a body. They would steal anything. And they would steal a body. I don't know about you, it's not number one on my list of things to do. Uh, I don't even think it would be a fun thing to do. <laughs> Billy, come on, man, let's go to the cemetery tonight. Dig up, open a casket, steal a body. Ha <laughs> ha! That'd be a great thing to do, wouldn't it? No, I don't understand that at all. But they made money off of it. Many times they were paid by other people to cause confusion. Grave robbers. <laughs> That stone was put there to keep people out, to keep the dead in. The women saw that the stone had been removed, and some gospels tell the angels telling the women that Jesus is gone, he's risen. But really, shock rocked the women. Jesus is gone, and they don't have any idea where he is. And let's say that you're one of the women. You're a follower of Jesus. You walk with him. You heard him. You are a devoted follower. You saw him die. You saw him taken down. And guess what? You know he's dead. Would you not want to know where Jesus is? I absolutely would want to know. But what would you have done? Would you have gone looking for him in this big garden cemetery? Or would you have done what Mary did? Ran to tell. Ran to tell. They ran. Mary Magdalene ran. I don't know how fast Mary Magdalene could run. I don't know if she's a track star. I don't know if she, after 10 meters, would just fall over and collapse. But she ran. She ran all the way from the cemetery to where Peter and John were. Needed to tell Peter and John. They didn't hesitate to tell what now, at this moment, now hang with me, at this moment, according to John, all this stuff is awful news. Absolutely awful, awful news. Terrible news. Horrible news. They thought somebody had stolen his body. And it wasn't supposed to happen this way. It's not what Jesus had said. He said that after three days he would rise. You see, in John chapter 2, let's read these words. Jesus speaking. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? And then Jesus speaks. And he answered them, Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. 
They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple. And you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. You see, he told his disciples over and over and over again that he was going to have to go into Jerusalem and die. Amen. And then be raised on the third day. This is another example of him telling them. But so often they didn't listen. Are you listening today? Are you going to listen to what I say? What God says through me? What Scripture says today? Are you going to listen and then wrestle with it and try to understand it and apply it to your life? You see, if we come to church today and we hear God's Word and we sing the songs and God is trying to speak to us and we close the door, then you are no better off than closing the door to the sepulcher and you're inside it. Because you're not reacting to the Holy Spirit talking to you. Easter is a day of resurrection, Amen. of hope, of assurance. Do you have God's hope? Do you have God's assurance? Mary Magdalene, she booked, she ran to Peter and John and exclaimed, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they put him. I right now she was in a dither. And boy, that's an old word, isn't it? She was in turmoil inside of her soul. You ever been like that? She was all torn up. And she needed Peter and John to come and look. And she put the means to find it out on them what in the world had occurred. So we have the first visit completed to the tomb that morning. Let's continue and see what God says happens. John chapter 20, get it, verses 3 through 20. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture what Jesus had to read, why from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. The second visit. Right here we've got a huge portion of it, and it is Peter and John. They ran to it. Now, you know, I always talk about, this is my favorite portion of the Scripture when I talk about Easter Sunday and the resurrection. I like this gospel better than the other three, personally. I think it shows more. I think it tells more about the resurrection. Peter and John. John's a young, young guy. John is, is fast. Peter's a little bit older. He's not as fast. And they took off. And they ran. And they raced. And Peter was left in the dust. John rocked it. He really rocked it. And he got to the tomb first. And it said hmm, that John looked in. He stopped. He stopped. He got to the open door. The stones were removed. He stopped. He didn't even go in. He just looked there. And I, I came to the conclusion this week, my gosh, I've preached this many a time. Why? What got into John that he stopped? Why didn't he go on in? He loved, in fact, he loved John, uh, Jesus. Jesus called him the one he loved. He put that on John. And so why didn't he go in? Why, why did he stop? Have you ever wanted to do something so bad and then when it came to the moment and you came to that precipice and you did not go over? Have you ever done something, I mean, wanted to do something and you got to that day, you've been putting so much emphasis on it all the way, and when you got to that day, you couldn't do it? Was he confused? I think he's confused. Oh, well, wait a minute. Maybe he's frustrated. He's walked with 
Jesus for three and a half years. He knows Him like the back of His hand. He's heard Him speak and teach. He's seen miracle after miracle after miracle. And Jesus has told Him everything that was going to happen. And yet John is at a wall. He's right there and he won't go in. Are you there? Are you there when it comes to Jesus? Are you just right there? You know, you now know Jesus. You've been dealing with him, and, and he's been trying to get you to understand that he is in love with you. He loves you more than anything else in the world. And he wants you to love him back. He wants to have a relationship with you. And he can't have it unless you take the gift. Take the gift of Jesus. You see, that's where you might be. I know John was right there. But here, all of a sudden, Peter. Peter comes lagging behind. I can just see him. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's one line. It's Pastor Anthony. <laughs> Coming in there. You know, all, all the youth are already five miles ahead of him. Hang on, I got the lesson. You know, I can just see that. And, and here's, here's John. He's looking in. And all of a sudden, Peter doesn't even stop. You know what John feels? John feels wind on the back of his head. I mean, it was just like, Peter doesn't stop. He goes straight in. I love Peter. You all know that he's my, he's my favorite if you've been here any length of time. Uh, because he and I are so much alike, we open our mouth and insert our foot really a lot. And Scripture shows that, that he is so uh, impetuous. He is so, uh, uh, you know, doggone, he reacts first and then things, right? He always has. I just, I just love him. Um, and here he is, a man that wants to know something. Pew! Right past John. He didn't stop to make any decisions. He went right in there. You know, go on, go on in there. And this relationship between Peter and Jesus I remember uh, in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus told the disciples that he was going to Jerusalem to die and then on the third day be raised to life. This is Peter. Peter literally, Scripture tells us, that he took Jesus aside. He moved him away from the other disciples. He took him aside and he says to him, um, Jesus, ah, never, never, Lord. That shall never happen to you. That's called rebuking. Peter rebuked Jesus. Oh, oh my gosh. When I was growing up, if I rebuked my father, he rebuked that whoop out of me. He took care of me. Ooh, no. But Jesus, loving him, do you know what he says to him? Get behind me, say. You don't know what's happening here, Pete. I got things under control. So this relationship that they had, which was awesome. Remember, Peter walked on water. Everybody shake your head up and down. Peter walked on water. You agree with me or not? Yes. Absolutely walked on water. Then he took his eyes off Jesus, and what happened? Yeah, he, no, he didn't drown. Who said drown? He did not drown. He did not die. He just went underneath the water. But, you know, they had a great relationship. So here's John looking in. Peter, pew! Man, he flew by. And let's look at this. He's the first one in the tomb, and what does he see? Strips of linen laying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around his head. The wrappings of the body, and that's how they prepared the body. You see, the men that put Jesus to rest did as much as they could, but they didn't anoint him completely. But they wrapped his body and then they wrapped his head. Two separate portions of linen. And as you look at this, the wrappings of his body, it looks like that Jesus literally, literally, just came up through them. How many people have ever heard of the Shroud of Turin? I'm not saying that that's Jesus' grave clothes. The boy is close. And it shows a body just coming straight through the cloth. And then the wrappings of his head were folded up. 
repeatedly. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I laid at your feet that grave robbers would never have done that. Grave robbers would have come in, grabbed the body, and gone in and out as fast as they could. So I am telling you that this body was never stolen, but there was resurrection that came in. Now, as Peter looked and was taking all this in, John finally steps in. And Scripture says that after he's been out here a while and John Peter went through, he steps in, and then it says, he saw and believed. Are you the type of person that has to see things in order to believe? We're going to laugh at just this next statement. I truly believe that my Cleveland Browns are going to win eight football games this next year. <laughs> I knew you all laugh. I don't have to see that. I literally believe that. But are you the type of person that has to feel something in order to believe it? Has to see it with your own two eyes? Has to touch it? Smell it? Faith is something that God has given us that testifies to our and God's ability together to accept something that we don't fully comprehend. John saw and believed. He saw and believed. As a senior in high school, the scripture was laid out in front of me, finally, because I never went to church until I was a senior in high school. I have a buddy here who was in Sunday school class with me. I don't know if he remembers that or not, but it was pretty cool. But when the scripture was laid out in front of me, I saw the scripture, but I couldn't see Jesus. <coughs> but I believed in the word of God. He saw and believed. It was that simple to him. Seeing and believing that Jesus must have risen from the dead to affirm the eyewitness account of an apostle. You see, those two believed that something happened that was miraculous. It wasn't ordinary. It wasn't an everyday happening. This was extraordinary, miraculous, and a miracle. And they knew something great had occurred and that the grave robbers had nothing to do with it. And they went home pondering what they had just seen. Pretty cool, right? I love that story to that point. Two visits. Pretty cool stuff. But now, for my heart, and maybe yours, the meat. John 20, 11 through 18. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, woman, why are you crying? They're taking away my Lord, she said, and I don't know where they put it. And at this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not recognize or realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener. She said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I'll get him. And Jesus says to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out, Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go and stand to my brothers and tell them, I have ascended to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. See, Mary's encounter. Mary was the third one that ran back. Remember, John, Peter, Mary. Haven't heard about Mary. Mary had been standing outside. She got there after Peter, so she was the slowest of the three. She's tired from running to and from. She just got there. And she's crying outside. And she, after Peter and John, John have left, she looks inside again. She was weeping. She was crying so hard, I believe that there were big giant tears that were coming down off of her face. But it didn't keep her from looking into the tomb one last time. Something had changed. What moved her to look again? You see, God wanted her to see something. And two angels were there. And one of them, they said, well, why are you crying? Wait a minute. Now think. Were those two angels in there a second ago with Peter or John? No. This is a special thing. Women, if there's something about this day, you know, that uh, 
aside Jesus rising from the dead, which is it, this portion of Scripture of John is awesome. Women in the Jewish culture weren't even thought of. They were so far down the list, they couldn't do anything. You couldn't even go into the temple. You couldn't worship in the main temple. Women were seen as second, no, women, third, no, wait a minute, fourth class citizens. But who does God use as the messenger? Who does God use and allows to see him first after his resurrection? Mary Magdalene. It's awesome. These angels were sitting in there and they had to comment. But Peter and John didn't see him. They knew why the tomb was empty. And the question, why are you crying? It was an obvious one. She was hurting. Now, I do want to say something. I, these angels, I think they probably look like humans. This is. Don't freak out. Do your study. Check it out. It didn't raise any big red flags for Mary Magdalene because of that. Okay, so now remember in others, other gospels, you're going to see them saying they're shining and white, but in John's you're not. Here it is, and it says, they've taken uh, my Lord away, don't know where they put him. You see, Mary wanted an answer, folks, and she wanted it now. Not in an hour, not in a day. She wanted it now. And then all of a sudden, something caused her to look back over her shoulder. Have you ever been in a situation when you felt somebody was behind you? Yeah, you, you know what I mean? And, and she, here she is, and she's talking with these two angels. And said, I, I don't, so I, they don't need to, so they've taken him, and I don't know where they played him. And all of a sudden, she feels something, and she turns around, and the scripture talks about, man, here it is. Conversation that happens. And there stood Jesus. I had somebody this week say, Pastor Mark, why in the world didn't Mary recognize Jesus? There's many times in the scripture where Jesus was standing there or with a group of people, came into a room, and the people didn't recognize him. It's because he didn't want them to. It's an easy answer. It's one of faith. I believe he didn't want them to. Same thing happened here. I don't think that it was because she was crying too hard. I think he just didn't want to. And Jesus asked the question, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Same questions, right? Second time, she looks at him. I love God. And has her think that he's the gardener. Okay, there's some humor in that. Pretty cute if you ask me. Would the gardener or the caretaker... Be in a cemetery? Yeah. It's a natural assumption. She can't see because Jesus has not given the clarity yet of who he is to her. And thinking that he is the gardener, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you put him and I'll get him. I love her. I love her. I love her. She's on a mission. She's determined. She will not let this thing go. That's like so many of you women. You won't let something go. You were on it. You're going to find out. You're going to, you're going to recover the answer. It's dead going it. You're never going to stop. And men, you're like that too. You won't stop until you find it. When I lose something at home, I look and look and then I say, Cindy, I lost something. She comes in and finds it. She won't quit. She finds a bad boy. I love her. That's why I married her. <laughs> I lose stuff. She finds it. So. Then it all changed. In a one word statement, everything changed. Amen. It just didn't change for Mary Magdalene, it changed for you and me. Yes. He says, Mary. Scripture has already said that disciples will know the Lord's voice like the sheep know the shepherd's voice. And he says, Mary, the best thing that you ever want to hear 
in Jesus call your name. And he says, Mary. She immediately recognizes him, screams out, <laughs> and falls forward to touch him and to grab him. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? What would you have done if you were the person there and he screamed, Mark? Dude, I would have wanted to grab a hold of him. I would have wanted to hug him. I would have wanted to kiss him. I would not have let him go on. He would not have gotten out of my grasp ever. Jesus is dead. He's alive. He's in front of me. I'm the first to see. I'm going to grab a hold of him. I'm going to grab him. You see, that's what he wants you to do today. He wants you, if you don't know Jesus Christ, or if you're struggling in your life, he wants you to grab a hold of him today. Not tomorrow, not tonight, not this afternoon, this morning, today. He's calling your name. The great thing here, he's a resurrected Savior, and he's calling Mary's name. And you know what? She knows that it's Jesus. Her first reaction is to grab a hold. He says, no, 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 i got to go to my Father, your Father, my God, your God, but i got a job for you, Mary. I want you to go and tell the disciples, you be my messenger. You want a mission, Mary? Now I've given you one. Grab a hold of it and go. Go and tell. And man, Mary ran. Now, if I was a betting man, which I'm not, I would have bet that if we could take Mary's running right there to the disciples and put her in the next Summer Olympics, gold medal winner, 100 meter yard dash, because I'm going to tell you, her feet barely touch the ground, I think. Have you ever had news? Great news. In, in our family, it's called hot pancakes. Have you ever had hot pancakes? Do serious, it is. That's a code word. When Cindy said, oh, I got hot pancakes, it's like... <laughs> if you got, you, have you ever had news and you wanted to tell, you want to go tell somebody, that's it? She runs faster than fast. She had the best news ever and was excited to tell her friends. Imagine that. When she got there, she screamed, I have seen the Lord! It's the greatest news ever, folks. He's risen. And she tells him, and she proceeds to tell him everything which has happened. Awesome. The story of the risen Savior seen by witnesses. You see, Jesus rose on Easter Sunday. Make no mistake of that. In fact, during the next 40 days, he was seen by over 500 witnesses. And this is the greatest news the world has ever experienced. The grave is empty. Jesus is risen. Amen? Amen. The grave is empty and Jesus is written. Amen? Amen. The reason he did this is for you. For you. You. Us. Me. You. 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 All of us. All. We're the reason that he died on the cross. He loved you so much that he wanted to take away your sins and be the sacrifice that there had to be. Thank God Jesus didn't die. He rose from the grave. And is alive and well in his Father's right hand. He did it so that you could make a choice and say yes. Yes to Jesus. And allow him to become your personal Lord and Savior. This is the greatest day ever to accept Jesus. Amen. Your resurrection Sunday. The change of your life. Are you ready to make it the best day in your life? Let's do it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your grace. For the stories for your love, for the opportunity that we have to make a choice, a decision. We thank you that you have risen from the grave, that you are alive, that you have been our sacrifice, and now you give us an opportunity to accept you. We understand the story. It is great. It is a wonderful story. Now apply it to our lives, oh God. Please, oh God, please apply it to our lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray, and all God's children said, Amen. Pastor Anthony, would you join me up front, please? And right now, our band is going to play a, a song. It's called an invitation song. And folks, what it really is, Scripture tells us that we, we must respond to the Word. The Word has been given, and now it's your, your time to respond to it. So listen to me and look at me. Don't shuffle around, look at me. Number one, if, you're come, if you've come to Days or Sunday and you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, you're called a seeker. You're trying to figure this thing out. Okay? And that's all right. But everything's been laid to you today. Jesus died for you. So the opportunity for you to accept Christ as your personal Savior and Lord is now. Don't freak out. 
when the song begins and you want Jesus, you just step out and come down here and one of us will lead you in a short prayer. It's a salvation prayer. We're not going to embarrass you. We're going to rejoice with you. But we're going to be happy. And it's the best decision you've ever made in your life. If you are here and you're looking for a church and this one floats your boat, everything's good, we'd love to have you. We believe membership is important. Becoming a portion of the family of God here at GF, we're going to continue to grow. Maybe you need to grow with us. If you need to be baptized, full immersion. That means your nose underneath the water. we got a baptistry. We'll dunk you. Okay? We'll do that. That's cool. And if you just need prayer, if your life is not going well, the altar wraps around the stage. Pastor Anthony and I will be here to pray with you about anything. Bring somebody up. Pray together. If you see somebody praying, go pray with them. You know, those are the things. That's what makes coming to church so good. We're family. We care about you. God wants you to love Him. Do you want to do that? So decision time. And it's all right. If your heart's beating a little fast and your hands are a little sweaty, that's God saying, I am all about you. And he's knocking on your heart's door. How about today? Let's stand and sing and let God move in the hearts of the people that are simple to death today as a family of God at Genesis Fellowship.